Well, uh, first of all, thank you very much for the invitation to talk with everyone tonight and uh, give my shameless plug for free TV here. So uh, that's what we'll be speaking about. Let me uh, spin up the presentation and then I'll share this up here. Please get the slide deck up. Looks like it took away my, uh, there we go. All right, is that coming up okay for everyone? Yes. All right, excellent. Okay, um, we're gonna talk tonight about uh, digital voice over HF, uh, specifically using the Codec 2 for the FreeDV software. And we'll go through many things. I'll be stepping through some of this. Um, I hope not too very fast. So please stop me if there's a question or something you want to cover or catch me uh, after the presentation. We'll go through all of that in a lot more detail as necessary. So we're going to talk about a few things like this, uh, some of the more popular methods of uh, digital voice that have been around for a while. Uh, a couple of the solutions have been used, some uh, not used today, but some of the older ones and some of the newer ones that we're doing. Some advantages and some disadvantages, as with everything, there's some pros and cons, and we're always trying to find the best part of all of those. Uh, the hardware that it's required to uh, be able to participate in that, the software as well. And what the software uh, looks like, we're going to go through uh, specifically around the FreeDV client and um, some of the ways that uh, appears and some settings and things like that. Uh, we'll have uh, some links to the technology where you can get those components and not presented in this presentation, but uh, certainly available for conversation uh, is the methods for VHF and UHF modes. Uh, Lots of stuff going on in the background there, uh, specifically around FreeDV, the 2400A and 2400B modes. Uh, but uh, primarily, we're going to talk more about the HF side of uh, operating these things. So some of the most uh, popular methods uh, for the past and present. Uh, AOR was a very nice box many years ago. It uh, made it real simple to get on digital voice. I guess I can minimize some of this. Maybe it'll maybe unclutter the screen a little bit. And um, what that would do is plug into the microphone of your radio. Now, this was uh, certainly well before we had the luxury of digital interfaces in our radios, USB ports, Ethernet jacks, all the fun stuff we have today. Uh, but it made for a very quick and easy installation just to... Uh, uh, plug it in and, and all of a sudden you were able to dial up a frequency and start communicating. Uh, WinDRM was a software solution, uh, Windows uh, specifically, and uh, it worked pretty okay. It was a really nice uh, first cut. And then we came up with, uh, I say we, uh, very uh, easily take that we, I wasn't part of it, but I was able to take advantage of it. Uh, an application called FDMDV. Uh, it uh, was a fantastic uh, uh, work at using software uh, for a Windows environment. Uh, and it uh, used a proprietary commercial codec though. Uh, it uh, had a very thin bandwidth, 1.2 kilohertz, uh, and worked exceptionally well for many, many years. Uh, and uh, this was started in about 2007 or seven, yeah, two, yeah, some little 2010, somewhere in there. Uh, and, uh, and it was great, really, really worked well. Um, one of the problems we ran into was we wanted to start developing the client after a few years, enhancing it a bit. Uh, and when it got time to do that, uh, one of the application programmers that was going to be working on the project wanted to get... Uh, an approval from the commercial customer that was allowing us to use the uh, the uh, uh, proprietary codec that they have, uh, but um, uh, they were not willing to freely allow us to incorporate that in our software going forward, even though they were perfectly happy with us using 
it in the client we were using at that time. Uh, so that kind of put us in a, a bit of a pickle, uh, to say the least, uh, because it was um, several years where we couldn't uh, couldn't do anything uh, to enhance it or whatever. But you'll see a little bit more about what has happened uh, since that time. Uh, another thing uh, uh, that's used today is D-Star. Uh, D-Star is used on, on HF. It's built into many ICOM radios today and just about all of their new HF radios are uh, supporting that uh, now. Uh, and then of course the free DV is something that came out in 2012. So it's, uh, uh, as of this year, it's just barely 10 years old, uh, but it is using uh, Codec 2, uh, which is an open source standard for a codec. And it is based on the same FD MDV user interface. So it was a kind of a similar interface that we were all uh, used to working with. And the, uh, the primary part of FreeDV from, from day one was trying to have a very, very thin uh, client, uh, as, I'm sorry, clear spectrum use. Uh, as uh, many of you can remember, uh, you know, 10, 15 years ago, we really had a problem when the band conditions were working exceptionally well and there was a lot of crowding on the band. So having a very, very thin uh, spectrum was very uh, friendly for the bands and allowed us to operate over there without uh, having to step on too many different uh, uh, other stations and everything. But uh, as mentioned here, the, uh, the bandwidth is typically about one kilohertz to 1.5 kilohertz wide and uh, different modes are a little bit wider. And we even have a, a newer one that just came out very recently that's uh, a little over two kilohertz, but we'll we'll talk about that here in just a moment. So, okay, let's see here. And uh, so this is uh, an image of the AOR device, uh, the one I was talking about that just plug right in the microphone of your radio. And, um, and of course the, the price of it, as you can see right there, the ARD 9800, it's $650. Uh, per unit, uh, a little bit pricey. They came out with a lower end version uh, that sold for around $400 uh, that still got the job done. Uh, but uh, uh, again, a little bit pricey. Uh, not all hams uh, were ready to drop that kind of money for, for just to operate on digital voice. Uh, and then of course the ICOM, this is just a small subset of the radios that uh, support uh, D-Star today. And, uh, and as I mentioned, there are more coming out all the time. Now for FreeDV, uh, after having the software for many years, uh, one of the options came out with similar in concept to the way the AOR device works. This is a hardware solution. Uh, this makes it incredibly simple to, again, plug right into, uh, right into the microphone jack or a data jack on the back of the radio, whichever is more convenient. And uh, this does something a little bit different, uh, some other enhancements, in that uh, while the, uh, the case may not be uh, uh, shaped much like a microphone, it works exactly like a microphone in that uh, it has a speaker on the front. You see the large uh, dots up here on the top uh, in the cabinet, and then a small microphone element right here. So you literally can pick up this little box, just like a microphone, and there's a push to talk button on the side of it that you can't see in this uh, image here. Uh, but you can actually start talking uh, with that to someone else on free DV. Uh, the unit is flashable uh, via USB interface. Uh, and of course, no computer is necessary other than the one that's inside this tiny little box. Uh, the price for that is about $200. Uh, unfortunately, at this time, the units have been sold out for, for quite a while, a couple of years now. Um, and we're not sure when uh, David Rowe, uh, the author of FreeDV's uh, codec and everything, uh, is going to make another run. Uh, but uh, there has been some chatter about that. If there's enough demand for it, that might uh, certainly happen. Uh, right now, today, most of us are just using software. And we'll, like I say, we'll talk about that in a little bit more detail. This is another solution uh, that uh, Muneer 
uh, Salem has created, K6AQ, uh, this uh, will do exactly the same thing like the SM1000. Uh, it uh, has some, some other enhancements that are pretty clever here though. Uh, with this one, it can uh, specifically around a 70, IC705, uh, it can do a Wi-Fi link. So no cables are necessary to the radio. And then you plug your, your uh, headset into this board and uh, you're on the air. Uh, you're ready to do uh, digital voice free DV once you dial up the frequency on your radio. Uh, this is still uh, still work in progress. Uh, it's on the air. It's being tested. Meniere's is using this. I think he's uh, made about two or three uh, cuts to it to enhance it a little bit more. Um, not exactly sure when he's going to be ready to offer that and uh, or how it's going to be offered for that matter. Uh, he's talking about a few ideas. He may just make it available and let others uh, purchase it as a pre-manufactured, pre-assembled board uh, and then uh, put your own case around it. And then there's some talk about designing a 3D case for it. So uh, uh, watch for enhancements to come out on that as, uh, as this fully uh, develops. And uh, so here's uh, digital voice. Uh, uh, the digital data stream audio. I have a couple of sound clips here. We'll see if we can uh, get the audio coming out real good on this. To uh, uh, let's see here. Try to spin this up. Uh, one of the things that that uh, we we like to try to communicate as much as we can is because um, FreeDV is it makes a digital sound. Not everybody. Uh, recognizes that as a digital mode. Uh, to many, it just sounds like noise on the band. So all too often, you may be in the middle of a conversation and somebody will spin up a single sideband cue so right over the top of you. Uh, so I like to play these back uh, little sound bites here just so people can hear what it sounds like. So hopefully that audio is coming through okay. Uh, but if you've ever used uh, digital slow scan, uh, the audio sounds very, very similar to that. Oh, let me go back one more because I want to uh, want to play this. No one. sound came through. I'm sorry. Say again. No sounds coming from your video. Oh, you're not hearing any sound make it through. Oh, that's unfortunate. When you brought your uh, your share your desktop up. You on the lower left hand where you get to choose where you're going to share. On the lower left hand side is a button you need to check to include sound or it won't play. Yeah, I was I was trying to play it through my other speaker over here, uh, like I normally do. So not sure about that part, but okay, we'll we'll circle back around to that then. Uh, uh, okay. Now, so let's talk about the free DV requirements, uh, what that takes. Uh, certainly it requires a computer and a radio interface of some kind, exactly the same way you might do PSK31 with FL Digi or uh, SM780, uh, uh, some of the, the ham radio deluxe utilities, uh, FT8, uh, WSJTX, things like that. Uh, but you do need one other interface beyond the digital side, you need an analog side. So if you're going to um, talk into a microphone or some kind of headset, some kind of way to speak into the software, if you will, of your computer, uh, and then a way to play it back when someone is answering you. Uh, and it can be done a few different ways. Uh, as mentioned here, a headset, uh, I use speaker phones, uh, uh, USB speaker phones more often, uh, makes it very, very easy for doing that. Uh, or, but it could easily be any other thing. It could be a standalone microphone or it could be a standalone uh, set of speakers. Uh, a lot of our laptops today have all of that built in. So you can certainly use those uh, quite, quite easily. Uh, the software today uh, for FreeDV is available in the uh, Windows, Linux, or Mac format. Uh, so it's very versatile uh, and uh, it looks almost identical across the different platforms. Uh, FreeDV, most importantly, is an open source software application, and uh, that's a major plus right there. Uh, we don't have to ask permission of anyone to integrate it into other 
uh, software applications or other radios or anything like that. Uh, one of the uh, things that came out many years ago, I say many years ago, probably about seven, seven or so years ago, uh, Flex Radio, the 6000 series radios were, uh, were coming about and Flex created a waveform uh, API tool set for application programmers to be able to write code to and interface directly into Flex radios. Uh, they, uh, they created the waveform where FreeDV would actually install right into the radio and it would become just a, uh, a standard mode, just like upper sideband and lower sideband. Uh, unfortunately, about five years ago, uh, uh, one of the code updates broke that ability and it's been down ever since. Now, what uh, Manir has done, who's one of uh, our uh, key developers, who's been doing a fantastic job for uh, code updates and feature enhancements, uh, he came up with a clever idea to uh, integrate a, a Teensy 4.1 module uh, to where you could plug that into a USB jack in the back of the computer. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, not computer, into the back of the Flex radio and then uh, load some software into the Flex radio and then you get that waveform. So basically offloading the audio uh, encoding and decoding onto this uh, little um, $30, $25, $30 board uh, gives us back that uh, capability. Uh, and it's still in test right now, but uh, it's working extremely nicely. Uh, but again, a key feature of FreeDV in general is the very narrow bandwidth, even today. So it's less than a sideband signal uh, mentioned here, like 1.1 to 1.5 kilohertz. Some modes are a little bit wider than others. Um, and then, of course, there's the hardware solution that, that we were just uh, showing previously, the Smart Mic SM1000, uh, as well as the Easy DV uh, uh, integration with the IC705. And the 705 is listed here uh, as, as only a key target. Uh, that's what Veneer is doing today. This uh, soon will work with all other radios just as easily, uh, but probably not the Wi-Fi connection. It'll probably have maybe a, a physical uh, wire audio cable connection between the easy DV device and the radio, something like that. But that's, uh, as mentioned, still a little bit in, in development. So here's a little bit of some of the advantages and disadvantages. Uh, number one, and a big one for me, is there's no static to listen to. Uh, I'll load FreeDV up every day of the week uh, and through the night, and it's just running in the background. And there's no sideband noise, no uh, sound of people uh, tuning up on frequency and all the other heterodyne sounds you may hear throughout the day. There's nothing but pure silence until a free DV station comes on the air and calls CQ or uh, uh, starts talking with someone else. Uh, again, a big advantage is the uh, very narrow bandwidth. Um, and then of course, uh, using your PC microphone, uh, as we were talking about a while ago, that's the, the, for the analog side of getting this in and out of the computer, uh, opens up all kinds of, um, uh, possibilities, inexpensive ones, or even more expensive, uh, PC headsets, USB headsets, Bluetooth, etc. I have a Bluetooth headset I sometimes use uh, with this, and it works very well. Uh, sometimes um, there um, people have used the little uh, $2 uh, USB dongle. You can get off of Amazon and uh, places like that, and then plug one of the older uh, simple PC headsets into it, and those work perfectly fine as well. Uh, one of the disadvantages of, uh, that can be had is if you fall into a hardware solution, uh, specifically around some of the older devices that are, are not really used today, like the AOR devices and things like that. Uh, if you can't flash them, you typically can't update the code, you can't keep current with um, new standards or new feature enhancements and things like that. So uh, that requires a little bit of extra effort when you want to make uh, some kind of a change. Uh, and then one of the uh, minor disadvantages of FreeDV is that it does take a, a bit of time to, uh, to get the audio mapping set up. And I'll show that uh, in just a moment. You can see some of the differences 
because it gets a little bit confusing because many of us are quite comfortable with setting up the digital interface side and everything because we're doing that with all of our applications today for digital modes and such. Uh, but when you add the other part of the analog side, uh, sometimes that gets a little bit uh, hard to follow. And uh, there's some code enhancements uh, that soon may come out to help uh, try to auto detect some of that and take some of that uh, uh, complexity out of the out of the mix. Uh, some of the hardware required, uh, we talked already about the AOR interface uh, in order to do the digital data uh, and voice and such. Uh, D-Star, you know, of course, that's real simple. You buy uh, an ICOM radio and you get that, uh, the newer HF radios, I should say, and you get that pretty, pretty easy. Uh, the Thumb DV device, it's a little USB stick uh, that uh, used to be sold by Flex, but uh, it comes from Northwest Digital Radio. Uh, but uh, it, it's a really nice ambi chip uh, device uh, that would plug right in the back of the flex radio and it would give you a D star right on the flex radio itself. However, the same time when the 3DV waveform was broken, it also broke the D star waveform. And uh, at this time, there's no, uh, no solution for working around that problem uh, so far anyway. Uh, the uh, free DV, as I mentioned, uh, you know, once you have the digital interface side, uh, you do need that second card adapter uh, in order to give you the analog part of the audio. And then we a uh, little bit redundant here, but we did talk about the SM1000, uh, the advantage of not having a PC required, and then also the Easy DV that uh, Lanier is working on. Uh, so from a hardware perspective. You know, these are things that if you don't want to use the, the PC side, the computer side, uh, then there's some, some a uh, couple of hardware solutions. Uh, certainly the better advantage is using the, the free software uh, that runs on the Windows, Linux, or Mac environments, uh, and then you're on the air uh, in, in no time at all. So here's a link to where the software can be found at uh, freedv.org. And, uh, and then some uh, radios, uh, some of the other SDR radios like the Hermes or HP SDR and ANAN and even the legacy flex radios, you may need a, a virtual audio cable. Um, typically you're gonna do that anyway for any other digital mode. So again, this is no different than, than what you may already be doing if you have a radio of that environment. And the same for the virtual serial port. But I thought it was worth putting a, a link in here for those uh, components. If, uh, if someone may not already be uh, operating in the digital world, uh, be easy for, for them to find those components. Uh, this is just kind of a quick screen interface of what it looks like uh, specifically here with a, a Power SDR software. This is very common for anyone that's used to the uh, HP SDR project from Tapper as well as Hermes, also from Tapper, and then, uh, and then ANAN, which is the uh, commercial instance of the uh, Tapper project. Uh, this, this would be uh, quite, quite common. Uh, and you see the frequency right there. It's worth mentioning uh, that 14.236. Uh, that's the, uh, probably the 99% the, uh, of all activity in the US here, uh, we use that frequency. Uh, other frequencies are used in different places, and you'll see that on, on a screen here in a moment, uh, some of the recommended uh, choices that are out there. But uh, that's usually where you'll find most of the activity. Uh, this is what it looks like, uh, just using a, a flex screen here as an example. Uh, the, uh, the radio at the bottom, again, configured for a digital upper sideband if you're on uh, 20 meters. Uh, one thing about this, even though it's a digital mode, uh, FreeDV follows the same uh, conventions that we do for single sideband. So if you're operating on uh, you know, 10, 15, 20 meters, you'll typically use upper sideband. Uh, if you're going to operate on 40 and 75 or something, then you're going to go to lower sideband. So we, uh, we try to stay in the voice part of the band and kind of follow that format. Uh, this is uh, at the top left there is the FreeDV client. Uh, we'll uh, actually break that down a little bit further in some other slides, but 
uh, at a quick glance, you can see in the middle, there's a, a waterfall spectrum there. When a signal is coming in, it's being decoded, you'll see the shape of that waveform uh, change quite a bit, uh, as well as you'll see a call sign down in the bottom of the screen uh, of who the person is that's uh, actually transmitting at the time. And then over on the, the far right over here, you may not be able to see my cursor very well, my mouse moving around, but uh, there's multiple uh, modes that are available. Um, and each of those have a little bit of a different uh, flavor to it. Uh, I have a chart that kind of gives you more detail about what those actual differences are. Uh, one of the new features that was uh, added in uh, many months ago uh, that's extremely nice is uh, one of the problems we used to always have in the early days is that someone would come up on one of the older modes because they may have found uh, an older version of the client somewhere and they would start transmitting and wondering why nobody could hear them and, and anyone uh, and, and uh, no one was coming back to them at all. Uh, so uh, one of the features added is a um, uh, what they call a multi-mode. So basically several modes, it goes through a scanning process, continuously scanning, and whatever signal comes up, whatever mode is being used, the client locks onto it and starts decoding. And the beauty of that is, is now it no longer matters. If you're listening, say, for example, in this case, 700D uh, is, the, uh, is the mode here. And that's primarily the dominant mode we're using today. But if somebody came up on one of the older clients on the 1600 mode, we would still hear it perfectly fine. Now, uh, if we come back to that person, we would be transmitting on 700D, uh, but, uh, but that person on 1600 would, would typically not be able to decode that if they did not have a version of this client that supported the multi-mode. So uh, over here on the left-hand side, it does show what, uh, what mode, uh, underneath the red modem here on the left, it says mode 700D. Um, if, uh, if we saw that was 1600, uh, we would just change our client to 1600 and then uh, help the person out with uh, getting the newer version of the client. And this is the audio setup. So I wanted to, to really show this um, uh, because it, this is the part that I mentioned before that's probably the most confusing. Uh, when you're going through and setting it up for the first time, uh, you'll notice at the top, it says input to computer from radio. So this is your digital interface on the top side. So again, you just go through, select the audio of choice, whichever one you're using for your environment. And then below, uh, it's looking for the computer to speakers or headphones. So this is the analog side. So you just select that, that choice, whichever one uh, fits your needs. And then there's a transmit tab down there at the very bottom uh, that will look like this slide here. And it's exactly the reverse. The top side of the interface is for the analog, the microphone to computer. And then the bottom side is the digital interface, which is your computer to radio. Uh, and then the PTT part of it, uh, it uses uh, Hamlib uh, if it's available. Most all of our newer radios certainly support that. Uh, just select your COM port, your, uh, your baud rate you plan to use. If you uh, don't, uh, if you happen to have a radio that's not supported by Hamlib, uh, you can certainly use the manual serial port settings. And then it's like anything you've ever used before where you set your your COM port up, your, uh, and then you choose whether you're gonna use RTS or DTR, whatever way you plan to key the radio. A couple of other settings uh, in the client here. This is talking about where you can put in some information about your text message. Uh, there's an option there, uh, we, like you see here, it says K5WH, and then I have a link to the uh, QSOFreeDV.org site which you'll see that screen in a moment, which is just a, a big round table chat window uh, website. Uh, but one of the newer features is this PSK reporter option uh, where you put in your call sign and you put in your grid square. And the beauty of this is that 
if you have that option turned on, as you're transmitting any station that receives your free DV signal, uh, it sends that up to the uh, PSK reporter site. So, uh, uh, which is very, very handy, makes it a lot easier to find stations. If you don't know where they are, what country they're in, or, uh, or maybe you're hearing a signal on the air, but you're not hearing them come back to you very well. It's a nice way to find out where the activity is. And you can certainly turn your beam that direction or uh, start listening closer to something where they may be. Uh, this is just changing that, uh, uh, the waterfall style where you saw the red screen uh, in the center and such. You could change that to black and white if you wanted or a blue tint, uh, just kind of a personal preference thing. Most people leave it in the multicolor because you'll see it change from red to yellow and sometimes black, depending on uh, the signal coming in and how well it's being decoded and such. Uh, the voice keyer option is very nice. You can record uh, any kind of a message. In my case, I just have a simple message, <clears throat> excuse me, that calls, uh, calls CQ over and over. Um, and uh, the really neat thing about this is that it has the option over here on the right where you can tell it how long to pause between that message. Uh, like in my case, I have it set to uh, pause for 10 seconds, uh, and then it will repeat based on whatever number I set over there. So it'll call CQ uh, five times, uh, and then it will back off. Uh, also embedded to this uh, is that if you're calling CQ, and this is a very slick feature here, that if someone answers you and you're in between your calling of CQ, the client will recognize that station as, as it decodes it and will immediately disable your CQ message ready for you to respond back to them. So uh, that's a really nice feature that it's a lot more uh, friendly to the world, if you will. So you're not calling CQ over top of somebody trying to, uh, to talk to you and such. Uh, this is the, uh, the mode I wanted to mention specifically about, uh, I was talking about the multiple modes, uh, the option to turn this simultaneously decode all HF modes. Uh, so uh, this is the one that's scanning between the different modes and detects uh, any one that it can lock onto and start uh, decoding for you and playing back through your speaker, of course. Uh, this is a kind of a graphical equalizer uh, type interface, so you can uh, shape your audio if you choose uh, for the speaker side as well as the microphone side. Uh, I bring this up uh, because this is really a very nice feature. Uh, we've been able to take uh, with this equalizer here, uh, I've been able to use it as an example, taking a, a $2 USB um, interface for sound card, like I was uh, talking about earlier, and make a, a simple little, you know, $10 PC headset and be able to adjust the audio with this. And it can sound every bit as good as my beautiful, nice head, uh, Heil Pro headset, uh, which is uh, quite remarkable for something to be able to do in software. Certainly a lot more, uh, a lot less uh, expensive when you do it that way, of course. Uh, this is a shot of the PSK reporter, uh, what I was talking about earlier. Uh, many of you are probably very familiar with uh, the PSK reporter. Uh, this works on all kinds of digital modes or many other modes as well, for that matter. Uh, but you can see the, where the activity is and who's hearing who. And uh, uh, what, you, what you can't quite see is over in the lower left corner. It has other information about uh, the signal strength, what mode of the free DV software they're on and things like that. Uh, their grid square, all kinds of good stuff is listed in there. And this is what it looks like when you're transmitting. So you have the ability to see what your own uh, transmit waveform looks like. Uh, this helps you be able to know if you need to increase your analog audio drive uh, a little bit or uh, if you may be too hot. Uh, one of the things you might see if, uh, if your audio is a little bit uh, too elevated, uh, it'll, it'll flash a message on the lower left-hand side that, that is telling you that your audio is too high. So you get some, some feedback there. Uh, over on the right-hand side near the bottom, there's this TX attenuation. 
should you find that the digital audio drive is a bit too high, uh, maybe you're seeing a trace of uh, ALC or something like that, uh, this uh, gives you a real simple way to back the audio down there and, uh, and, and bring it back uh, some. Uh, there's a squelch option. Uh, what this squelch does here is uh, you can kind of put a threshold on how far down you want to go and still be able to decode signals. Uh, kind of a digital version of what we already have is a squelch knob on our radios today. Uh, in this case, uh, single sideband typically is about zero uh, as far as an SNR. So that's kind of our rule of thumb measurement of, uh, uh, of where things uh, come apart, if you will, or not able to understand very well. Uh, but you see right here, the way this slider is, it's actually set at minus two. And that's because we're using a 700D mode. And this 700 delta mode here actually works a couple of... Uh, uh, dB below the noise floor. So, uh, and I have um, uh, several times in recordings captured of uh, speaking with stations, uh, even overseas, uh, specifically over in Austria, uh, talking with a gentleman there. Uh, we were on free DV, the signals were kind of soft or whatever, but we had a perfect conversation on digital voice. And so we switched to a uh, single sideband uh, just to kind of see what the comparison was. And it was completely and totally gone. Uh, not even uh, movement on the uh, S meter, nothing in the waterfall, uh, no audio sound coming out whatsoever. We switched back to digital voice and it came through just perfectly. Uh, so that was uh, a major uh, uh, step forward with FreeDV because that's always been a design goal from day one to at least be as good as single sideband uh, and that was a long time coming uh, because uh, sideband has always worked very well. And uh, it took quite a while to finally come to uh, enough enhancements in the code to be able to make it uh, perform even better than single sideband. This is what uh, the waveform looks like when it's decoding a signal. Uh, this one, in this case, is actually using the mode 700E, which is one of the newer modes we, uh, we tried out some time back uh, and still use today, but uh, it doesn't work quite as well below the noise floor. Uh, so we've kind of uh, gone back to the 700D mode for most of the operations uh, that we do today. And there's an example of the modes uh, being changed uh, even while transmitting, which is one of the nice features of uh, this, this multiple mode. Uh, while someone is either transmitting or receiving at any time, you can change just by clicking on the tab, whichever one you want to, uh, to switch to. Uh, whereas in the past, we always had to stop the client uh, and then make the change and then restart the client. So you'd lose a few seconds of decoding time. Uh, but now it's all uh, super quick instantly. Uh, it, may, it may take about one second or so for it to resynchronize on the, the signal that's transmitting uh, and lock onto it and start decoding right away. Uh, I was uh, talking about some of the comparisons here. Um, so some of those different modes, uh, starting with 1600, which was the primary mode that uh, we had started with even before the uh, FreeDV uh, client came about, the FDMDV client used 1600 mode. Um, it, um, but uh, nowadays we're using that 1600 mode with the codec two. Uh, and this tells you a little bit more if you wanna get more into the, uh, uh, the, the RF the bandwidth and the raw bits and FEC and all kinds of good stuff like that. But this column SNR here is probably the most important one to, uh, to understand uh, because this tells you uh, how well it's going to work uh, in real time uh, noise activities, uh, band fading conditions and things like that. So some of these clients may be uh, better with selective fading, multipath and things like that, uh, but uh, maybe not as good in some other areas. So uh, that's the, one of the primary reasons for the multiple uh, versions of, of HF modes uh, so that you can try different things, different conditions. 
Uh, I was speaking earlier about this Teensy module that you could plug into the back of uh, a flex radio. It's uh, again, just something simple you can get off of Amazon. Uh, you load, uh, uh, load some code, some hex code, you flash this board with, and then you install some software on your uh, PC. And then uh, from the flex radio, you go through an installation for a waveform and it pulls out off your PC and puts it in the radio. And, and now you have uh, the digital mode right in the radio. I'll show you an image of that, like this one right here. And so it shows up where in start, instead of having a, uh, a USB digital or uh, LSB digital, whatever, you now have a mode called FDVU for free DV upper sideband. There's an FDVL for a lower sideband. The, uh, the real major advantage to having this in the radio and, uh, and why it's really been a hot button for us to try to get this working again uh, is because once you have it in the radio, you no longer need to worry about the, the PC side of it or does it work on Windows? Does it work on the Mac or, or Linux or anything? Uh, it works just in the radio. So any way you can access the radio, you now have access to free DV. A uh, perfect uh, example of that is uh, quite often I may be traveling out of town or something like that. Well, I can access my flex radio remotely uh, just using uh, an iPad. And so with my iPad, I can uh, select that FDVU mode and even remotely I can access my radio and operate free DV. I don't have to worry about what the client works on and things like that. So that's a, a major, major enhancement and, and hoping that we can uh, make this even better. Uh, there's a lot of work that's been taking place and certainly Manir has been doing a fantastic job of trying to uh, get the code working uh, with all of this and working tightly with Flex to, uh, to get uh, all the API code uh, updated and everything. So. Maybe, uh, maybe we'll see even more of that uh, real soon. We're certainly counting on that anyway. Uh, this here is a FreeDV QSO finder. You know, one of the th things that quite often comes up is how do I find out where the people are? You know, where are people hanging out? What are they doing? What mode are they on? All that kind of good stuff. Uh, it's a, a simple little web page. Uh, John Hayes, uh, K7VE, created this exact type interface for the DSTAR world, and he was very kind enough to create the same thing for us for FreeDV. So if the screen looks familiar to you, uh, it, it certainly should if, uh, if you're a DSTAR user. The, uh, the great thing about it is it's as simple as you connect up like this and say, hey, this is Walter. I'm in Houston, Texas. Uh, turn your beam down this way. or uh, where are you located so I can turn my beam in your direction. Uh, a major uh, feature of this is down here at the bottom. These, um, uh, what we, we call these preset frequencies. Uh, nothing about this changes your radio or anything like that, uh, but it's uh, just kind of a preset uh, suggestions of, uh, of where to operate, where you have a better chance of, of finding other, other stations. Now, of course, uh, just like uh, with any other uh, uh, mode of sideband, if you will, uh, whatever mode or whatever part of the spectrum you're licensed for, you can certainly operate free DV in that space. Um, but it's kind of nice if you know a uh, better target of where to, um, uh, where to land, uh, because uh, at least you have a better chance of finding other stations. Now, when you uh, select one like this 14.236. If I just connect to this site, I come up and I, you know, put in my call sign, I land on the page here. I click on any one of these frequencies. What, what a nice thing it does is up, it puts me in this box up here on the left hand side underneath the uh, other frequency. So it will show me what the other stations are that are also happen to be on that frequency. And it could be uh, multiple ones, could be uh, anything that someone has selected. So um, very, very nice there. Uh, so here's uh, a couple of the reference links I wanted to have, uh, to, again, to kind of reiterate a little bit on where you can download the software, uh, www.freedv.org for the, for the clients, multi-flavors, of course. The QSO finder that we were just showing uh, is this qso.freedv.org. A uh, great place to chat with others. 
Uh, there's also a, uh, a part of this website here, the a quick startup guide uh, for those that want to go through uh, start to finish, uh, uh, maybe a little bit slower or something and understand a little bit more about some of the pages and configuration options. Uh, it's a really good manual that someone has uh, put together, as well as a couple of YouTube videos to show you some of that also. And then here's an, uh, a link to the interface, the SM1000 interface box that uh, David Rowe uh, has um, created to, for those when they're available and such. And let's see. And this is probably a, a big one here. So timing is absolutely wonderful for, uh, for the Rat Pack here tonight because uh, this weekend, uh, we're gonna be doing another free DV activity day. Uh, what that is, is uh, every quarter, we kind of pick a day, and usually it's about 24 hours or so, where people are able to operate. Uh, we recommend people jump on free DV and just make contacts. It's not anything like a contest as far as formal logging and all kinds of requirements you might have to do for that. It's not any kind of a contest. Uh, it's just a way of trying to help promote free DV and uh, equally important is helping others get their clients configured uh, so that they can uh, get on the air, make it happen, um, or find others that uh, uh, may be trying to work in their local area that maybe they can't reach out to some of the further away stations. Uh, so that happens this weekend, November 5th and 6th, um, starting at uh, 12 a.m. on Saturday there on the, uh, on the 5th. It'll be going through Sunday and such. So if you, uh, uh, by all means, uh, we don't, certainly want to invite everyone to join us and uh, hopefully have a, have a really good time on that. Uh, and so uh, again, just kind of re reiterating the qso.freedv.org. Uh, if you um, uh, want to join us or ever have any kind of issues that may need a little bit of help with, with uh, FreeDV or anything like that, uh, I also run a uh, 7 by 24 Zoom channel. We have uh, operators from all over the world that are in there day and night. Uh, it's kind of a very large mentoring session, if you will, uh, with a lot of really brilliant people from everywhere uh, that we're always on. So uh, drop in, say hi, and uh, you know we may be chasing satellites one minute or doing digital modes the next, but uh, we're usually always around. So hope uh, we get a chance to speak with a lot of people. And uh, I guess that's uh, what I've got for the presentation. I guess at that point, I'll kind of open that up and uh, let you guys fire away with questions that you might have that I, hopefully I can answer for you. Uh, I'm not hearing anything. <laughs> um, hey, Walter. Hey, Mario. Um, you were going to talk about the VHF UHF uh, uh, portion, I think. Okay, sure. I can talk about that. So there's a couple of new modes, uh, the 2400A and 2400B. Um, what, what that is, is uh, the 2400A is a new mode that David Rowe created a few years ago. Uh, it's de it's uh, designed to work with a custom built radio. And I say custom built because the radio is built as, or to be built as a, a digital radio, not unlike what you do for DMR, Fusion, D-Star, things like that, but it would be a different style radio. And it would have integrated in it this uh, 2400A mode. Uh, so it would work uh, way down below the noise floor and, and give you a lot of great communication. And, and uh, the early concepts of that was to be uh, operating all the way up to, I think right around one gigahertz or something, but uh, it, was, it would cover VHF, UHF, all the way to one gigahertz. What the, what the 2400B mode is, um, uh, because that radio is not uh, available, uh, about the time uh, a lot of chatter about that was coming about, uh, we started running into some of the early parts of uh, hardware. Uh, getting boards designed the way we want, to getting components. Uh, uh, the component shortage was just barely starting to, to, to take off. So it's kind of put the brakes on everything there. 
So most of the development on that, unfortunately, has kind of been parked right now. Uh, however, uh, I wanted to test the uh, the software. The, I wanted to be able to test the concept of the software and the way it would communicate and such. And so I asked David if he could create a version for us that would do all of the same type of uh, encoding and decoding, but not at the efficiency of the one that would be buried down below the noise floor, but something that would be simple enough that we could interface to a cheap Bofang radio or any analog radio of any kind, just feeding audio in and out. And, uh, and so he created that 2400 Bravo mode uh, for us to do that type of testing. Uh, it's probably also worth mentioning that along the same line of what's, uh, what the 2400A mode um, is uh, all about uh, something that you may have uh, heard something about already is an exact uh, similar concept uh, that is probably a lot further along, and that's the M17 protocol. Uh, the M17 is a has a TR9 radio that's being designed uh, that would do all of these things we were talking about. They would use the 2400B, and the M17 protocol actually uses, it's based on the exact same codec 2, the same way that this 2400B was going to be used. So I can't say that for certain, but I would, uh, I'd probably put some heavy coin on the fact that M17 will probably be the direction that, that this would take off. Thank you a lot. Appreciate it. Certainly. Mm -hmm. uh, hi, Walton. Yes, sir. Yeah, I just have a question. Can can you play the raw and the encoded waveform? Uh, we we couldn't hear from okay. the first few slide. All right, let me see if we can do that here. Okay, back up a few slides here. Here we go. Can you hear that by chance? Why do you say? Yeah. Just, just. Sounds like a swarm of mosquitoes or something. <laughs> so that's what it sounds like, uh, the raw audio part of it. And this is what it sounds like once it's been decoded. Hopefully that made it through there. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, the, one of the, the major highlights for me personally is the fact that while you can hear the audio coming through very well, you, you don't have to listen to all the other static sounds and things like that that are... Uh, Walter, we're hearing the audio from your radio. We're hearing the static. There's oh, also right. the audio that we're playing. Oh, that's not good then. Okay. Let me uh, let me stop sharing then. <laughs> okay, did that stop it? Yes. Yeah. Okay. But we really couldn't hear the voice well. You could not hear. Okay, that's terribly strange there. Yeah, the uh, audio for the HF rig was mixing in with it. Okay. Well, let me see if what I can do about stopping that part of it, and let's try that one more time, very briefly. That is between uh, How about now? Ohio and Texas, uh, sometimes on 20. Oh, uh, much better. Really strong okay, very propagation. Good. I know I like JT65, and uh, I usually try to run like Zilla lot when the band's good. I have fun seeing how low I can go. My T3, uh, 
you know, it was reliably to about 200 milliwatts, uh, measured, uh, you can hand it down to a tenth of a watt, but measuring it with a terminating watt meter, it really only goes down to about 200. Is this raw or encoded? Okay. All right. Here's the raw audio. Okay. Yeah. Don't hear it. Oh, you didn't hear that at all? Interesting. You know what? It could what it could be is the zoom part filtering. I need to put it on the raw audio. Let me turn that, change that. So okay. Let's go back here one more time. Yeah, very high pitch noise, and that's all we hear. Do you, did you hear that that time, or something different? It's a very high pitch noise, constant that's, noise. Yeah. yeah, that's exactly what it is. Correct. You, you woke Dan up. I'm sorry. Say again. You woke Dan up. Oh. <laughs> yeah, it can be a little bit noisy there when that's all going on. <laughs> But like I said, uh, the, the unfortunate part is sometimes people don't recognize that as a digital signal and, uh, uh, and you just kind of step all over us. So it, it causes a little bit of grief now and then. Uh, Walter, uh, Walter, you had a couple of uh, charts that were up. One was a comparison of the bandwidth of each of the modes and the other one was uh, waterfall showing the width and the different uh, carriers within that signal. Can you go over that again and describe how the different bandwidth is between 1600, 700, 2020, and 2400? Because what I'm looking to do here in New York City is to make it available for the users to use on, uh, let's say, FM simplex as well as on HF. Okay. All right. Very good. Well, uh, right here, this is, say, the 1600, for example. Uh, it's 1125. Uh, hertz, if you will. Uh, 700C, 700D is right at 1000 hertz for that mode. Uh, this mode 700E is a little bit wider at 1.5 kilohertz. And this 2020 mode is uh, right at 1600 hertz. So it's a little bit wider. Uh, still, still very narrow, you know, in comparison to everything else. Um, but with it comes uh, some of the trade-off, uh, as I mentioned. Sometimes uh, changing the modem out, so, uh, a case in point, something I didn't mention very much about is this 1600 mode. One of the beautiful things, the way Digital Voice Free DV works, is that when you have this signal, uh, let's, let's go back up a couple slides. When you see this mode right here, See how there's multiple stripes of audio or st uh, multiple stripes of data. What this is, is taking your voice and slicing it into multiple slices based on the frequency. And so your audio information, your lows may be here and your highs may be on this other part. And then if you're in the 1600 mode, it has seven carriers where it sliced that audio into seven carriers. It then puts a pilot tone in the center so it helps you fine tune the radio and lock onto that station. And then it replicates the exact same information on the other side of that pilot tone. The, the fantastic part of that is that if you get some selective fading or say a sideband station starts crowding uh, on, and wiping out half of your signal or whatever, you never miss a beat on your audio because it's already on this other side as well. Uh, you know, or you might have selective fading that comes fading across where it comes across half of the band, uh, taking out carriers, but it's still good here. And by the time it starts taking out the other side, it's all good on the left-hand side. So again, you don't miss a beat, uh, not even a syllable. Uh, there are times, of course, when, when someone keys over top of you or something that blocks your signal that it will lose synchronization. And then, of course, you might expect it, it's going to, uh, drop a, a syllable or sometimes a word or two till they're out of the way. Uh, but, uh, but that works really, really nice. Uh, and and uh, speaking more about that pilot carrier, the reason that that's, uh, uh, it, it's not being used in the later modes and such, because the signals are typically so much stronger 
uh, we don't need to lock on to that center frequency um, as well. Uh, however, uh, some of the other modes have a lot more carriers, so they're slicing the audio up many more times. Uh, but also uh, something I definitely wanted to mention was that um, we actually use FreeDV through the satellites as well, linear satellites, uh, VHF, UHF, uh, in the sideband mode uh, on uh, RS-44 and FO-29, some of the birds like that. Uh, and uh, we, we prefer to use the 1600 mode, even though it's an older, uh, older mode that's not as popular, uh, having that uh, sync signal there makes it really, really simple for us to see that on our client for the downlink side and be able to adjust for Doppler and things like that and just really lock on to the signal. And it, and it works amazingly well. And uh, in doing so, we don't have to worry uh, when we're working through the linear satellites at all about the, uh, the signal because, uh, you know, where you may need 20 or 30 watts on, uh, on HF, uh, at times, uh, on the linear satellites, one watt works just as good as 50 watts. Uh, it just it just works uh, quite nicely. Uh, but that did, does kind of lead me to uh, another point I wanted to make about power. Uh, sometimes uh, uh, we all know digital modes usually operate nicely on lower power, and uh, free TV is no different. <clears throat> excuse me, in that respect, uh, quite often we'll be in a conversation. I normally run about 20, 30 watts or so for the majority of my conversations. Uh, however, uh, all too often I'll turn the power down to one watt and it's no different. Uh, carry on for hours at a time uh, in a QSO uh, at one watt on each end and it, it just, just chugs right through uh, very, very nicely. The uh, Probably the only reason that I turn the power up even to the, the 30 watt or 40 watt even sometimes is so that others hear that uh, that sound, that audio sound you heard a while ago uh, and know that uh, and hope that they know that there is something going on on the frequency that they probably don't want to start a sideband conversation over top of it. But it's certainly way overkill for what it takes to carry on a, an audio conversation. Uh, Walter? Yes, sir. Um, just for Mac users, uh, uh, after version 1.8.2, it requires a current Mac OS. Uh, you can't, uh, if you're running, let's say, Catalina, a Mac OS 10.15, you can't run uh, 1.83 or later. Just okay. So there's an OS version dependency. Oh, okay. Uh, unfortunately, I'm not a Mac user, so I'm, I'm not at all familiar with that part, but Muneer is certainly the guy that's... Uh, creating this and can certainly answer any questions you might have. Or if you see something that uh, you think would be an enhancement of some kind in that area, I'm certain he would love to, to hear from you and get your thoughts on that. Well, it'd be, it would be useful uh, if he had in the release notes when he introduces a, a version dependency on the operating system so that people, when they're on the page looking at it, can determine which one to download. Okay. All right. Very good input. I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. Walter? Yes, sir. Yes, the Sherwin K5SEK. Okay. Uh, I'm new to this, but is did, will this work through a signal link TNC? Absolutely. It, yeah, it absolutely will. Yes. Do you have, uh, have, you have to be using Codec 2 or can you use standard Codec? No, no, no. Uh, to be clear, the, the Codec 2 is the encoding and decoding software inside the application. Uh, so for your signal link, you'll use the standard Codec that you already have as far as your digital interface. Nothing changes at, on that at all. Okay, that helps a lot, thank you. Certainly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there are, there are several people that use that. In fact, I was using one for many years on an old TS-2000 that I was using, uh, and it works extremely nicely that way. So. Yeah, I use I use the signal link for multiple radios. That way I can have one uh, laptop configuration that will work across multiple radios depending on what I'm doing. Absolutely. Great idea. Excellent way to do it. Mm -hmm. Walter? Yes, sir. In reading, I was noticing that they recommended the frequency of 14236 be used. Yes. Is there any specific frequency in other bands listed, or are we just kind of like free for all it? 
Well, so in the let me go to the slide with the QSO finder here. Uh, that was the reason uh, we have these presets down here. If you go to the QSO finder, you see all these frequencies down here at the bottom. So these are the recommended frequencies where you'll typically find activity if it's not on 14.236. This is where you're going to find it. Uh, a case in point, the, the UK uh, uses 75 meters uh, over there. They have a net every day at 4 p.m., uh, their local time, uh, and stations all over Wales and throughout uh, uh, England and other places in the UK uh, are operating there. Uh, Germany uh, uses 40 meters. Uh, I don't believe they're using the 7177 like we do here in the States, uh, but they, they do operate on, on uh, uh, 40 meters. But more important than anything is that whatever they're using, uh, if you don't, if you want to use a frequency and you want people to know, say you're on a different frequency, maybe 14.236 is locked up with a uh, a net or something that uh, we hear in the mornings every day. Uh, maybe we want to go to 14.240. Uh, you know, we do have a preset for 14.240, but maybe we want to go down to 14.233. You can enter that right down here in this Your Frequency block, and when you click on Update, it will post it up here into the, the QSO Finder into a separate box over here. So you can let people know where you're at and, and where they can find you. Uh, Walter? Yes, yes. Um, last time I was on the QSO Finder, it had a dependency for login through QRZ. And if that's still there, could you explain that to people so they know how to get in there? It's, it's actually HamQTH. Uh, okay. HamQTH well, yeah. is the one that's doing the database management. When John created the QSO Finder, uh, I guess he wanted to add some capabilities to uh, be able to post some information, uh, and it's probably wiser if I show it to you real time. Uh, can you see that screen right here? Okay. Yeah. Uh, when you when you're uh, this uh, so this is the live uh, screen of the QSO Finder. The the major advantage to this is that if I see uh, down here in the lower right corner, if I see these stations down here like K6AQ, and I want to know more about that person, if I click on that call sign. Over here in the user lookup, it tells me their name and location and even a map of where they happen to be. Uh, uh, and along the same line, if I mouse over it, uh, you know, I can I can look at all kinds of information about those people. Uh, what, I, what, I, what I was referring to is uh, is it used to be I don't know if it's still the I haven't been on there in a little bit of while, but it used to be that if you didn't log into QTH Finder or QTH first. When you clicked on the link for QSO Finder, nothing happened. Okay, that's no longer no longer okay. a limitation at all. Okay, uh, you you can put your you just put your call sign in, uh, and it will take you right there. Now, uh, one thing that I have seen uh, a few times is when someone takes over, uh, say, a vanity call, uh, and they uh, happen to be uh, landing on a previous call sign or something. Uh, they'll log in and, you know, with the name Walter or something or whatever the call is, it'll show up as Joe or Bob or something like that. Uh, and the way uh, the way you can fix that quickly is uh, there's a link here at the bottom of HamQTH. If you log in over there, uh, basically you're just you're creating an account on HamQTH with your right credentials uh, and, and it will update the information. There's a database that gets pulled. Um, I believe John pulls that probably about every four to six months or something. It's not happening all the time uh, that will update this database eventually. But if you want to do it uh, faster, have it come up correctly uh, right away, you just update the HAM QTH and it takes care of that for you. Okay, Victor, you got your hand up there. Would you like to have the floor for a little bit? Thank you. Good evening. Uh, Walter, you had a slide showing a um, analog speech and you were discussing the alarm system for oversaturation. I think it was you were talking about for overmodulation. Oh, okay. Uh, I think we're talking. I think we're talking about this slide here. Is this the one? 
That's correct. Okay. Uh, I'm curious on that, on any system that does this sort of such. Is there a, uh, a percentage base that says that there's a threshold? I mean, you can do an occasional maybe 1% and you don't get an alarm, but if you hit a 10% or 20% threshold, then you get an alarm. Does that um, make sense there? Yeah, yeah I, I, under, I understand your question, uh, certainly yeah. do. Uh, um, I don't know about any percentage or anything like that, but I will say that if I'm running the, if I'm running the client myself, I may be you know, looking like this right here, nice and in the blue, but if I get slightly too close to the microphone, you know, may get a little bit uh, too hot to the microphone, uh, you may see it flash up there that says too high or something like that. And that's okay. That doesn't, it doesn't hurt anything. Uh, it's just that the person at the other end, instead of a, a crispy, clear sound, they may hear something like a, a zzz or something. It may mellow out your tone uh, in your voice. They'll still hear everything you're saying, it's just that a syllable or two may may sound a little bit uh, strange to them on the other end, a little bit different than what it naturally should be. So it is accommodating if you do it occasionally, but if you see it happening quite often, it's certainly worth uh, trying to make the the adjustment to bring it down to hopefully prevent that. Right. Thank you. I'm pretty. Mm -hmm. Okay. Are there any more questions? Answers? <laughs> uh, Barry, you want to take on chat? What, what we got there? Absolutely clear. Well, that's been a good presentation. <laughs> oh, my. <laughs> yep. Okay. Well, um, you will send me the, the slides on that. I certainly will. I appreciate that a lot. We'll get it out there so everybody has access to that. It's been a great presentation. Thank you all for coming. A hi, Ray, uh, W7CIA. I haven't I haven't seen him for a coon's day. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, he's, uh, so with that in mind, we probably should call the plug and uh, come back tomorrow for tomorrow's presentation. Uh, so 73s, everyone, appreciate you being here. Uh, Walter, I really appreciate you uh, giving this uh, this presentation. You did a great job. I think uh, it's obvious by the by the comments and the lack of comments in some cases here. <laughs> very good. Well, thank you very much for having me. I appreciate it, and look forward to catching up with you guys again soon.